been asked to talk about the, the human gut microbiome in relation to diet. Um, and we've recently been doing an NIH funded study in um, Alaska, uh, which is fascinating because uh, the Alaska native people previously called Eskimos uh, have the highest incidence and death rate from colon cancer in the world. Uh, that's remarkable because when I was at medical school, they all said, well, you know, the Eskimos were protected from getting colon cancer because of, you know, the large amounts of fish oils that they consumed. But that is not the case anymore. So um, what's important to know is, is that colon cancer is a preventable environment induced cancer. Epidemiological surveys um, of diet and cancer show that there's a 20 fold variation around the world. Um, and so, therefore, you know, it's not a, simply a genetic thing. Uh, Monozygotic twin studies show that 5, five to 10 percent of all cancers are due to an inherited gene. And then there are migration studies, for instance, the Japanese who moved from a low colon cancer country um, before the war. Um, to uh, a high, high, a high rate when a, a number of them migrated to Hawaii, and that's just within one generation. Um, in general, it's fair to say that colon cancer results from environmental pressures in genetically susceptible individuals. So, I'd like to ask the audience: What do all these diseases have in common? Cancers of the colon, breast, prostate, pancreas, liver, allergy diabetes, obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, and atherosclerosis. So I can't see the responses, but uh, next slide. A westernized diet. Okay, so um, the westernized diet um, is classically high in meat and fat and low in fiber. And if you look at a classical uh, American meal here, uh, looks delicious, but unfortunately it's not very good for you. Uh, the meat tends to be grilled or fried, increasing the risk of uh, carcinogens. Um, there's a lot of fat, which stimulates bile acids, which, which are potentially carcinogenic. The carbohydrate tends to be in refined form and very little fiber. Um, alcohol is very popular, and that also increases the risk of colon cancer. Then there are preservatives as well, which contain carcinogens. And I ask you, where is all the fruit and vegetables gone from the westernized diet? Next slide. So studies from around the world have, have correlated what people eat with what the rate of cancer is, colon cancer is. Um, this is a review um, by the World Cancer Research, which was based on 43 controlled trials and their meta-analysis around the world. And it was shown that in uh, that, that red meat, processed meat, um, are convincingly associated with high colon cancer risk, whereas if the the intake of fiber and fiber-rich foods was associated with a low risk. Next slide. Um, so, uh, what's even more interesting, and as 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 uh, Laura showed in the last. Um, uh, presentation was that um, uh, a high fiber diet has remarkably good health consequences. And it's associated with uh, not only a low reduce, uh, a, a low risk of colon cancer, and in fact, um, non communicable diseases, uh, but it also increases um, longevity, and the quality of life gained in extra years, um, as shown in this micro analysis. Diet um, exerts its effect on colon cancer through its effect on the gut microbiome. Next slide. So if we look at this cartoon that I made, um, we eat food. And this is a stylized picture of what the gut looks like. A small vowel at the top and then colon at the bottom. Next slide. So we eat food. It's digested very efficiently by the small intestine and very little is left. And it was always thought that what was left and excreted in the stool is digestible waste, but, but it's now been realized that it's absolutely essential to the health of the colon. Um, next slide. What happens is that after 
passage through the small bowel, there are residues, particularly from carbohydrate, complex carbohydrates, which includes fiber, which stimulates the microbiota to ferment, ferment um, what's left to produce short chain fatty acids, which again, you heard in the last talk, were essential for colonic health. On the other hand, if you have a high fat diet, it changes the, the uh, character of the, and the metabolism of the microbes to uh, things that are inflammatory and promote colon cancer. Next slide. Butyrate um, is under intense study at the moment because it has remarkable um, physiological effects on the bowel and, and body in general. And if you eat a high fiber diet, then the microbes fermented to short chain fatty acids and butyrate is one of the most active in preserving colonic health. But there are other facts that does. It, it, um, butyrate is the primary food, food source for the colonocytes, not glucose like elsewhere in the body. Um, it's also immunomodulatory and um, anti-inflammatory. It stimulates Treg activation. Um, Remarkably, uh, butyrate is a histone deacetylase inhibitor, and so therefore has epigenetic effects, which again can reduce the risk of colon cancer. Um, it's anti-proliferative, apoptotic, um, results in cell cycle rest, and so therefore again reduces the risk of carcinogenesis. Um, it's um, principally involved in mucosal defense. It produces mucus, um, tightens um, junctions, so therefore there's less leakage of like polysaccharide and carcinogens, and produces defensins, which again maintain the health of the colon. And then finally, it's, it's a counter carcinogen. So if you eat carcinogens in the diet, you can actually suppress the effect by eating more high fiber, fiber diets. Um, most recent studies show that, in fact, if you have a very high fiber intake, such as is taken in the traditional diet, and you'll all remember the studies by uh, Burkitt in Uganda, pr principally, which showed that the very low rate of colon cancer and West Nile disease was associated with high fiber foods, um, and the average consumption of food, uh, fiber was between 50 and 150 grams per day, which is massive. If you think about the NIH, oh, sorry, um, um, USDA re um, recommendations in the USA uh, is 22 grams of fiber per day for women and 38 for men, which is way below what was associated with reducing colon cancer risk. And so it is, in fact, our suggestion, our hypothesis that, you know, it's not just um, a reasonable fiber intake, you've got to really get it up to the sort of African level. And if you do this, then um, it's not the, the butyrate that produce is not just utilized um, by the mucosa, but it goes into the circulation where it acts um, as a histone acetylase inhibitor, promoting epigenetic effects, which um, switch on satiety, reduce um, energy intake, and um, um, have remarkable um, overall body effects. Um, it also, um, butyrate links to G protein coupled receptors, um, which um, stimulate enter, enteroendocrine cells to secrete GLP2 and POYY, which enter the bloodstream and affect the pancreas to induce. Uh, insulin secretion in the brain to promote satiety and reduce food intake. So you can see that there are many mechanisms that it can actually not only suppress um, cancer risk throughout the body, not just the colon, um, and also um, reduce intake and therefore what might have a role in the treatment of obesity. Next slide. So how much fiber do we need? We've just talked about that. Next slide. So the Anchorage pilot study was 20 adults. So we wanted to really see, you know, what were the differences in dietary intake between um, Alaska Native people and the African studies that we'd previously published. 
Um, next slide. And these are the key findings. Um, as you can see, the, the total fat intake was um, about three times higher in Alaskans. And this is both urban and rural Alaskans. And uh, total carbohydrates, um, this was actually very interesting, uh, much higher in Africans than in Alaskans. Um, total protein content was much higher in, in Alaskans. And um, the um, vegetable protein, however, was very, very low. And total fiber was less than 10 grams per day. So it fits with a hypothesis that, you know, um, things like dietary fat, dietary protein, particularly meat, um, and, uh, high, uh, and vegetables of one sort or another have, uh, might well have um, part of the explanation for the high rate of colon cancer in Alaskans. Next slide. So we did an interesting study um, in um, KwaZulu-Natal um, where we um, uh, and it explored the possibility of changing the microbiota to change cancer risk in uh, Africans and African-Americans. So the interest about this is that African-Americans have the highest rate of colon cancer in the continental USA, obviously not quite as high as uh, the the uh, Alaskans, but uh, at about you know 80 per 100,000, and uh, whereas Africans are very low, and you know this was fascinating to me as a gastroenterologist, where routinely we do colonoscopies in, in America, and about you know one in five of our African American um, patients are found to have polyps which are precancerous, whereas so we do the same. Um, exams in Africa, particularly rural Africa, we very rarely found a single polyp. Next slide. Um, and what was interesting is that we um, selected 20 adults, matched adults from both populations, and we housed them within a facility um, in the USA in a, a research facility um, where they spent two weeks and we gave them good African food which was lots of uh, sadsa and vegetables and very little meat and um, uh, fried foods of one sort or another. And Af um, Africans, um, we admitted them to um, a lodge and kept them there for two weeks and gave them terrible but very tasty westernized diet for two weeks. And okay. uh, within that two-week period when we did biopsies from the colon, we were able to show that there was a significant reduction in biomarkers of cancer risk in African Americans and the absolute uh, uh, converse in, in Native Africans when they were given the American diet, prolifer proliferation uh, biomarkers of cancer risk increased. So that was yet more evidence that you could very, very rapidly change cancer risk by changing what you eat. So when you look um, at the composition of the uh, Alaskan diet, it is very, very uh, high quality with regard to biological value of proteins and fats because they hunt and they fish. And so they eat large quantities of, of um, uh, marine life and uh, wild foods of one sort or another. But um, when you look at the vegetable and fiber intake, it's very, very low. It's actually deficient. So and deficient not only in fiber, but also in phytochemicals as well. So this was our concern that it's basically an, a, you know, um, an unbalanced diet, new fiber. So um, <clears throat> we found that, you know, that it was associated with fiber deficiency and a high, high fat diet. And if you have a high fat diet, it increases the synthesis of um, uh, bile acids, which uh, when you know, eaten in large quantity, well, when you eat a lot of fat, it produces a lot of uh, bile acids, which go through to the colon and are metabolized by microbes to carcinogenic secondary bile acids. So that's yet another function of how you can actually uh, increase the risk of colon cancer. 
So again, we got some funding from the NIH to actually see whether or not um, these changes in, in biomarkers um, could be prevented by giving a high fiber diet and up to 50 grams per day, which as I say, was the amount it seemed that you had to eat to suppress colon cancer in Africans. And um, so it consisted of a four week randomized controlled trial of digestible starch, um, that's, you know, a normal food starch, um, to um, uh, undigestible or resistant starch, which is one of the fibers. And it's actually quite difficult to get fiber intake up in the normal westernized diet. So people thought, oh, you're never going to get to 50. But you could do it by this because um, resistant starch you can get as a powder, which is not um, very, very soluble, but you can produce um, a shake of it um, in a glass of water and drink down. And by doing that, we got everybody up to uh, 50 grams of fiber per day. We then followed them for a four week period. And we did endoscopies at the beginning and at the end, and also measured uh, short-chain fatty acids and the like to see what influence it had. Um, we've just finished the study, and we're in the process of writing it up. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, so our primary endpoint was proliferation markers in the colon. And we achieved significant difference in with resistant starch, um, shown, shown as RS. Um, and these were from biopsies done either by sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy. Um, and you can see that in those given digestible starch, there was no appreciable change in biomarkers. Next slide. Um, we also looked at short-chain fatty acids and were not too surprised to find that there were significant um, increases in fecal um, short-chain fatty acids, in particular butyrate. Um, it was interesting that there also seemed to be a trend towards an increase uh, with the digestible starch as well. And that might well be related to the fact that, you know, their diet is deficient in carbohydrate as well. So even carbohydrate might be important. And then the bile acids we talked about before, and um, uh, they were significantly reduced with resistant starch, uh, particularly with regard to uh, dihydroxycholic acid, uh, which uh, is again experimentally a, a procarcinogen. Next slide. So we looked at responders versus non-responders. Next slide. And uh, we showed the same sort of pattern. Um, there was no specific change in, no, no enhancement of short chain or, or acid, short chain fatty acid production in responders versus non responders. Next slide. Um, but there seemed to be an effect on bile acids. And it's quite interesting because we didn't change the amount of fat, but we changed the amount of carbohydrate. and it's been shown in many studies now that, in fact, if you have a high fiber diet, it suppresses bile acid uh, production and therefore um, uh, the formation of uh, carcinogenic secondary bile acids by the microbes in the colon. Next slide. Um, this shows that, you know, it's again, it's the PCA plot um, comparing the metabolomics. Um, of African versus uh, Alaskans. And um, shown here are the, are the two different populations, um, uh, African Americans and then on the right, uh, Alaskans. And it showed that, you know, there's almost complete separation of metabolites. So it's not just a change in butyrate, but a whole lot of metabolic activity in the colon is suppressed if you increase the amount of fiber. Next slide. And we looked at the microbiome com composition before and after the fiber supplement. And this summarizes the effects here, which shows that, you know, the predominantly I'd like you to focus on the red bars on the left hand side, which, which really are the most um, uh, uh, obvious changes in the microbiota uh, numbers. Uh, and in at baseline, 
uh, it was Fecula bacterium, which was were highest, and Blausha. Um, Blausha is an interesting, but because uh, in population studies, it's often associated with an increased risk of colon cancer. But in um, other experimental studies, it's actually been proposed to be used as a probiotic because it actually increases the health of mice colons. So uh, remember that. Um, just be careful about animal studies as they don't necessarily reflect the human situation. Um, but the bottom line was that, um, could you go back please, um, that there were, you know, uh, that Blauscher, Fecalobacterium, Agapacta, Lachnospira, uh, Doria, all decreased with resistant starch supplements. So it all I'm trying to say is that there was a, a, predominant, a major impact on the microbiota and the colon. Um, some of them we can explain because some of them are associated with increases in the production of butyrate. Others, we still have to do further studies to understand exactly why there's all this, you know, variation in different types of bugs in the colon. Next slide. And just to show that, you know, that, that the, the, the bugs themselves can actually induce cancer, we can't give it to humans and wait for them to develop cancer, but we can in mice. And these were some germ-free studies done in, in, together with um, our colleagues in uh, particularly Soren Ockbjerg in Germany, um, where we show, showed that it's a Swiss roll effect. Um, all, all these slides show us was the role effect. Um, I'd like you to focus on the darker uh, areas uh, within the uh, colonic um, epithelium, uh, which represent areas of uh, adenomatous fermentation and um, carcinogenesis, early carcinogenesis. First of all, on the control diet on the left, and then when we added fiber to the control diet, a whole lot of the, the uh, there was remarkable suppression of carcinogenesis. Um, again, indicating that it's a combination between the bugs and the and their metabolites that suppress colon cancer. So, Mr. Chairman, in summary, high dose fiber supplementation to receive 50 grams a day is effective in increasing colonic butyrogenesis and suppressing secondary bile acid production, so increases the good things, suppresses the bad things. This might explain the suppression of inflammatory and proliferative markers in cancer risk in the colonic mucosa. However, further studies are needed to determine whether these effects can be enhanced by further modification of the colonic microbiota metabolism by the addition of phytochemicals or natural high fiber foods. So. Remember that, you know, it's not just fiber we're talking about, but plant chemicals are very powerful antioxidants and they come together with high fiber foods and so therefore might also contribute to reducing the risk of colon cancer. Further studies are needed to determine whether the relative effects of other lifestyle changes that affect colon cancer risk, such as reducing meat, fat, and smoked foods, alcohol, and tobacco, what effect that they um, have on colon cancer as well. There is a lot of epidemiological evidence to suggest that these factors are also associated with increased risk of colon cancer. So we can't just say it's all due to fiber, it's due to the balance of the diet itself. Next slide. So I'd like to acknowledge the Alaska Native people who are extremely uh, helpful in the study and um, staff at the Alaska Native Medical Center and Tribal Health Consortium in Anchorage and um, uh, Christine Flanagan, Zoe Ma Ma Merritt and Danielle Lammers uh, we're all Af uh, Alaskan Native Natives who uh, uh, were involved in the research studies themselves and from the Pittsburgh side our lab um, particularly with uh, Loy um, Eberhardt and Miriam uh, Perez Casada. Uh, the study was, uh, there are lots of other people involved in the study, um, and uh, unfortunately I don't have time to go through it all, but it is in my other presentation. 
And of course, we can't do it without funding from NIH, uh, which we sincerely thank for. Next slide. Thank you for your attention. I'll be very happy to answer questions. Uh, there, so, is one, there is one from Irene uh, Bay. And uh, she says, thank you for the wonderful presentation, Prof. Are you specific with the, the type of fiber? For example, soluble or insoluble when recommending the 50 grams per day? So that, that's a great question. Um, the honest truth is that we don't know. We're not sure. Um, but I look at it from a physiological point of view. And definition of fiber is um, a complex carbohydrate that is resists um, digestion by the pancreatic enzymes in the small intestine and goes through into the colon, obviously. And there it's fermented uh, to produce short chain fatty acids. And um, both uh, soluble and insoluble um, fiber uh, have that effect. They are butyrogenic. And so therefore, I think that, that um, all for forms of fiber um, are good for the colon. Um, and uh, whether one is better than the other, uh, which is probably part of your question, we need to do further studies to actually see that. But they all produce short-chain fatty acids. The difference is that soluble fibers may produce more short-chain fatty, fatty acids in the proximal colon, whereas um, um, more resistant types of fiber, um, such as wheat bran, go through to the distal colon and therefore are more fermented there and might have a... Um, you know, greater butyrogenic effect in the distal colon, where a lot of colonic polyps occur. Uh, thank you, Prof, for, for a wonderful presentation. I would just like to follow up on a question. Um, during uh, the study, were there controls on specific foods that uh, were being um, taken by the participants? And then, just as I've said, from a dietetics perspective, uh, you have indicated very well foods is not just uh, a composition of nutrients. There are very many other things that constitute food, especially the one they take. Is there any specific role that uh, were played by phytochemicals and phenols in foods other than fiber that could also contribute to the same um, uh, reduction or enhancement of the factors indicated? Um, yes, very good question. I, I, I didn't get your first question very well, but the second one, um, you know, that, that's the thing about the study of nutrition is that it's, it's, it's very complex, as you probably all know, um, because food contains an enormous quantity of different types of nutrients, all of which could have profound effects on the gut. And um, furthermore, it also contains metabolites. And so therefore, there's a lot of studies going on at the moment to see the value of fermented foods. So you have pre-fermentation and, you know, sort of early production of um, uh, metabolites, which again can reduce risk, um, you know, um, as part of the general digestive process. So we don't just eat fiber, we don't just eat meat, we don't just eat one thing or other, we eat a balanced diet. And, and the secret of nutrition is to try and get back to what we were designed to um, digest and eat, which was, you know, um, the so-called traditional diet. So most of the problems with imbalance of diet occurred at the time of the agricultural and industrial revolution um, in, in uh, places like England, um, uh, nearly three centuries ago now, um, where suddenly there was a massive production of food, um, which then had to be processed. And they got rid of the, the fiber and the bran and so on from the diet because they thought it was just uh, rubbish. And they removed the food for the colonic microbiota. And uh, you know, that accounted for the sudden appearance of uh, westernized diseases. Uh, also increased the, the availability of, of food and calories, and so therefore 
um, obesity became a problem, uh, but it also resulted in massive uh, increase in the population. And so there are a whole lot of other factors that come together. But, um, you know, antioxidants is a very good example um, of something which has equally potent effects on suppressing um, carcinogenesis and, and inflammation. The problem with that is that it's actually quite difficult to measure um, phytochemicals biochemically. It can be done, um, but quite often by the time it gets to this tool, they've disappeared. So, you know, you've got to get at the interaction between where the metabolite is released in, in the colon um, and the, 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 the mucosa. Um, so that's difficult to do. Um, but there are other things. I mean, alcohol is a profound uh, carcinogen because it produces one of the metabolites as um, acetic acid, um, um, which, uh, again, is pro-inflammatory and in increases the risk of, of, of cancer throughout the body. And if you overeat too much, too many calories, then you produce obesity, as Laura told us. And um, obesity is now associated with 17 different types of cancer. So, you know, it's all coming together now that it's really the balance of food. You should, you know, not, you know, protein, meat and so on is good for you, but don't eat too much, as we do in the West. Um, and fiber rich foods uh, has a tremendous potential to reduce the risk of uh, morbidity mortality, and therefore increase longevity.